Welcome back to Pattern Recognition. So today we want to look a bit more into the independent component analysis. And in particular, we want to think about what it actually means if the components are independent. Now let's build on the previous ideas. So you can see that using the whitening transform we were able to uncorrelate the signals, but the correlation is only determined by the second degree cross moments, so the covariances of a multivariate distribution. Now statistical independence is a much stronger statement than correlation as it determines all of the cross moments. So this then means that if we have two statistically independent variables, y1 and y2, and two functions h1 and h2, we can have a look at the expected value of the multiplication of the two. So you could say h1 and h2 is the mixing, and you could say y1 and y2 are the actual signal sources. Now you can see I can write up this expected value as the double integral over h1 of y1 times h2 of y2 times the joint probability of y1 and y2 appearing together. Now we assume independence, which means that we have the joint probability expressed as the product of the individual probabilities. And this then allows us to split the joint probability. And if we do so, we can also split the integral into two integrals. And now you can see that the two remaining integrals only focus on one of the two variable, which means that I get the product of the expected values. So the extra moment conditions allow us to identify the elements of A uniquely. So we do more than decorrelation. In the case of a Gaussian distribution, this is not the case because it is determined by its second moments alone. So in a Gaussian distribution, you don't need the additional moments because if you have the mean and the covariance matrix, you have already determined the Gaussian distribution. So any Gaussian independent components can be determined only up to a rotation. Therefore, we assume that the SI are independent and we assume that they are non-Gaussian because if they are Gaussian, our independent component analysis would simply not work. If we look at the whitening transform, then this is typically a pre-processing step of our process. So you would have this observation that the matrix A typically has n to the power of two degrees of freedom. Now, if you apply the whitening transform first, you can actually see that we only need to consider the transformed feature space. So here x tilde is the transformed one, and then we would apply our mixing matrix. So we can essentially write this up as some a tilde, and a tilde is essentially the matrix that does the whitening transform and the mixing together. Now, the new mixing matrix is orthogonal. You can discover this if you look at the expected value of x tilde, x tilde transpose. So you look at the covariance matrix, and we know our independent component analysis is supposed to map onto our independent signals. So we can pull out our a tilde and e tilde transpose on both sides. And then you can see that this expected value of the signal and the signal transpose is nothing else than the covariant matrix of our signals. They are independent, so this is going to be the identity matrix. And now you just have A tilde times A tilde transpose, and this has to map to the identity matrix. And therefore, we can see that it's going to be an orthogonal matrix.
So a tilde is orthogonal and it has n times n minus 1 over 2 degrees of freedom and thus applying the whitening transform already solves half of the problem. So we can simplify the problem and we already get a step closer to our solution. So let's have a look at the ICA and find an illustration. So here we'll have two uniform distributions that we want to show and they are essentially mapping onto an equal probability that is determined within the interval of plus and minus square root 3 and if you do so then you get essentially a distribution like this one so you are uniformly distributed and independently distributed on both dimensions and then the joint probability is uniform on a square. This also has zero mean and the variance is equal to one. So these are our signals. So let's mix them. If we mix them we can set up a mixing matrix and here we just choose the matrix A as 2, 3, 2, 1 and now we can compute X and if we do so we get the following result for the mixed observation. So you can see that our square has been transformed into this diamond and now the joint probability density function is essentially a uniform distribution on a parallelogram. More important is even that the x1 and the x2 are not independent anymore. Now let's try to estimate A. So the edges of the parallelogram are the directions of the columns of A. In principle we could first estimate the joint probability density function of x1 and x2 and if we locate the edges of the joint probability density function we can estimate a. But this is computationally very expensive and this principle only works exactly with uniform distributions and we want to be able to process any kind of non-Gaussian distribution. So this is not the solution scheme that we would do in general, but it is able to capture the non-Gaussianity of the distribution and then apply this in our independent component analysis. Let's see what our whitening transform does. Well, the whitening transform, if we apply it to our data, it would map onto the following space. So this is x tilde 1 and x tilde 2. And you can see here that the joint PDF of x tilde is uniform on a square. The components are determined except for the rotation. So we are missing the correct rotation to map back onto our independent components. So the problem of recovering A tilde is much simpler than the recovery of the original mixing coefficients. So we see that in the ICA model we need to assume that the SJ are mutually independent. Also the SJ have to be non-Gaussian in order to be able to determine them from the XI. For simplicity, we assume that our A is square and then we still end up with some ambiguities. For example, the SJ are determined only up to a multiplicative constant and the SJ are not ordered. So let's see why this is the case. So you can see that the observation that we are actually getting is essentially a sum over the column vectors of A and they are multiplied with the strength of the respective signal. This also means then that any scalar multiplier for SI here can be eliminated by scaling AI appropriately. So we can get rid of this problem of not being able to determine the scaling because we could, for example, propose to restrict the matrix A such that it will perform a scaling towards a unit variance. But this still would leave the ambiguity of the sign. So if you multiply by plus 1 or minus 1, it would not affect the model. So you would still have the unit variance. It would just be flipped. And Typically, this ambiguity is usually insignificant in most applications because 
if you know how the signal is supposed to look, you can use a prior in order to figure out this ambiguity. So for example, if the gray values of your image are flipped, then you can very easily correct that by multiplying with minus one. You can very easily determine whether you have reconstructed the negative or the true image just by looking at the data. There is also the ambiguity of ordering. So here you see that we sum up over the columns and as S and A are unknown, we can change the order of summation. And this is then typically formalized by using a permutation matrix. And this permutation matrix is then reordering the entire sum. And this means that a star would simply be a new mixing matrix that needs to be solved. So generally, we cannot determine a sequence in the independent component analysis because of this effect. So if you did the unmixing, then you still have to identify which source was actually mapped onto which channel. So this is a general drawback of ICA and you have to do it again. You can use prior knowledge in order to figure out which channel is mapped onto which output of the ICA. So far, if we know A, we could compute the inverse of A in order to obtain the independent components. So if you consider a linear combination of Xi with a weight vector W, you could see that we could now express some Y as the inner product of the vector W with X and then clearly y equals to one of the independent components if w is one row of a inverse. So we can use this in order to perform a change in variables. So now let's map to some variable z and z is determined as a transpose w. And then you can apply this in the linear combination. So you get y equals to w transpose x and now we do the substitution. So we have W transpose A times S, and this can then be rewritten as Z transpose X. Now we know the result of the central limit theorem. The sum of a number of independent random variables tends towards a normal distribution. So you could say X transpose S is more Gaussian than any of the individual components SI. So Z transpose S is going to be least Gaussian when it equals to one of the independent components SI. This leads us now to the key principle of the independent component analysis. We maximize the non-Gaussianity of W transpose X and this will then result in the independent components. So if you have a look at the marginal distributions of the joint and the mixed signal, then you can see that if we have this kind of distribution, so for S1 and S2, and we compute the marginal of the joint probability, you can see now that for S1, we get essentially this distribution and you see that it is close to the uniform distribution as we actually have defined the problem. Now we can do the same thing with the marginal distributions of the mixed observations. And here you see that if we do the same computation, then we suddenly end up with something that looks much more Gaussian. So you see that the mixing of the independent components increases their Gaussianity. So um, this brings us then to the reasons for the importance of non-Gaussianity. In the case of Gaussian random variables, the ICA model can only be estimated up to an orthogonal transform. And by the way, if just one of the components is Gaussian, the ICA will still work. The Gaussian is the most random distribution within the family of probability density functions with given mean and variance. Therefore, it is the least informative probability density function with respect to the underlying data.
So distributions that have the least resemblance to the Gaussian reveal more structure associated with the data. So let's have a look at the importance on non-Gaussianity. The randomness can be measured using the concept of Shannon's information theory. And we do that by computing the entropy because the entropy is a measure of uncertainty of an event or the randomness of this measure. The differential entropy of a continuous random variable x with density p of x can be found as h of p equals to minus the integral over p of x times the logarithm of p of x integrated over x. Let's have a look at this theorem. The Gaussian maximizes the entropy over all distributions with the same mean and the same covariance. And we can actually prove this. So let x be the random variable, p of x the PDF that has the highest randomness. Then we can also rewrite the moments mi equations using a set of polynomials. So you see here where we introduce this as an integral of the PDF multiplied with some ri and this then results the moments and now we can see if we choose the r's appropriately we get the moments so here we choose the r0 to be always one and this then results in m0 which is going to be exactly one which is the sum over the entire probability density function now this constrains p of x to be a probability density function Otherwise, we can now use polynomials in R and these polynomials can then be used in order to determine the moments. And you see that these will then be the mean, the standard deviation and so on. Now, if we go ahead, then we can put that into a Lagrangian formulation for maximizing the entropy. So we start with the entropy and we constrain this entropy with our Lagrange multipliers. And you see here that the respective moments need to equal exactly the moments that we have determined. Now we can take the functional derivative with respect of p of x, which is the Gateau derivative, and set it to zero. Here you see then that our minimization with respect to p is going to be found as the logarithm of p of x plus 1 minus the sum over the individual polynomials that are determined to construct the moments. And this essentially then yields the family of exponential distributions. Now let's look at the first and second moments to be given by mean mu and variance sigma square. Then you can see that we can write this up in the following polynomial form. So this essentially breaks down to e to the power of minus and then 1 minus lambda 0 minus lambda 1x minus lambda 2x minus mu square. And now we plug this into our constraints. Here you see that the moments have to be determined by this. And you see here then that we get these three constraints. So the zero of moment needs to fulfill the property that is a probability density function. So the integral over the entire function needs to be one. The first moment is going to be given by the mean value and the second moment is going to be given by the sigma square. Now we can solve this and this is actually non-trivial but if we solve for the Lagrangian multipliers we get the following observation. We get lambda 0 equals to 1 minus 1 over 2 and the logarithm of 2 pi sigma square. Lambda 1 is 0 and lambda 2 is minus 1 over 2 sigma square. Now we insert this into our probability density function and rearrange this a little bit and you see we get exactly 
the Gaussian distribution. So the Gaussian distribution is the distribution that maximizes the entropy with given mean and variance. Now let's look at how we would then construct such an ICA algorithm. So we would apply a centering transform, we would apply the whitening transform, and then we start iterating. We take a random vector wi and then we maximize it with respect to non-Gaussianity of wi transpose x subject to that the length of the vector is 1 and the inner product of any other wj with respect to wi is going to be 0. Then we can increase the iteration counter and we do that for all our independent components. Then we can use this weight matrix once we have determined it in this iterative process and compute the independent signals using exactly this transform. And the final output is then the independent components S. So now let's look at a couple of notes on this process. The estimation is steered by maximizing the non-Gaussianity of independent components. There exist equivalent algorithms for solving the ICA. There are gradient descent methods and there's things like fast ICA. And there is even a relation to projection pursuit that was introduced by Friedman and Tucky in 1974. So projection pursuit is a method for visualization and exploratory data analysis. And it attempts to show clustering structure by finding interesting projections. The interestingness is then typically measured by non-Gaussianity. Now you see that non-Gaussianity is a very important concept for ICA and this is why we look in the next video into different approaches how to actually formulate this non-Gaussianity. So I hope you liked this little video and you understand now the principal concept of the independent component analysis and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you.